Thanks, Magenta. Hi, I'm Ruth. This is me. This is what was just said, I suppose. Um, so we can skip this. Oh, so the talk is about uh, being a manufacturing engineer in your spare time. Though I am trying to pick up embedded engineering in my spare time, so maybe that'll be next year's talk. Um, why manufacturing? So I think manufacturing is really cool because it's one thing to prototype something for yourself, like at a makerspace or whatever, and it's entirely another thing to productionize a product for manufacturing that lots of people can use. Um, but knowing how to leverage factory relationships and managing projects means um, being able to bring good ideas to the masses. And so I, I'm really into that kind of scale and that um, like one person making an outsized impact. So that's why I love manufacturing. Um, and what is manufacturing engineering? So the work that I'm talking about is the person in a company who's the connection between the rest of the company and the factory. So uh, the kind of stuff that you're working on is productionizing new products. Um, so there's some design, some CAD drawings, some prototyping, testing prototypes from the factory. Um, you'll also be maintaining old products, so working on improvements via customer feedback, um, investigating regressions in product quality. Um, so in my experience, uh, at working this job, for me, it's been about 80% project management, which is like talking with the factory and the company to make sure everybody's on the same page about product details, status updates, and so on. And then 20% engineering, which is more like CAD drawing, specs, documentation, testing, and so on. Um, so I, in 2016, I went to Effective Altruism Global, which is a conference, and I attended something called Hamming Circles, named after Richard Hamming from Bell Labs. Um, and so the idea with this event is that you'd be in a small circle, four or five other people, and for 15 minutes, all the other people in your group would help you solve the biggest problem in your life. Um, and so I thought about it, and I was like, what is, like, what do I want to do? Like, what is the biggest problem in my life? And uh, this was when I realized that I love everything to do with scale. Like, I love, um, at my day job, I'm a site reliability engineer, which enables software at scale. And that's, like, what I love about it. Um, and so, and I did a lot of maker stuff in my spare time, and I was like, okay, what I want to do is do um, making stuff at scale, which is manufacturing. Um, and so they were like, you have to learn Mandarin. Um, so I did start taking Mandarin lessons. Um, and also, I, two years later, I got my first paid part-time job as a manufacturing engineer, um, working with a factory just outside of Shenzhen in Dongguan to produce aquaponic and hydroponic kits. And we'll talk about how I did it. So there's two main elements of, or main categories of things I did towards getting a job, um, personal projects and personal branding. And the goal is to get paid. So the moment you get paid for something, you're a professional. So that's how you become a professional manufacturing engineer. You convince someone to give you money. Um, so here are some examples of my personal products that I made before I got my job. Um, shout out to Noisebridge Hackerspace for providing access to equipment um, and space for my projects. Um, so this is, this is a mix of like personal projects and meant to make money projects, but as a caveat, I never made money on a project that I was trying to make money on. And then I sometimes would make money in a project that I like didn't intend to make money on. So that, that never worked out the way I thought for me. So better to just not, not think too much about money and just do what you find interesting. So the first one is a iMac aquarium. Um, and I came to Noisebridge uh, really interested in doing this, and they were setting up the laser cutter at the time. So in doing this project, which is putting a fish tank inside an old iMac G3, I learned how to use a laser cutter and like acrylic prototyping and that kind of thing. Um, in the middle, we have the Leave Me Alone sweater, uh, which is pretty self-explanatory. Um, and then in the, on the side, we've got the um, Grow Bucket project that I did. Um, there's a DIY community online of people who um, grow plants inside buckets and they add lights and a fan and stuff. Um, and this was a project where I wanted to sell them and like didn't really sell any, but I got some experience like sourcing like medium, low medium volumes of stuff for, for this. This was a kit that I was trying to sell people. Um, and so personal branding means broadcasting that you are doing this kind of work and that you're passionate about it. So for all my projects, um, I would try to put them up on Unstructables just so that there would be documentation online. Um, and, and, and often people would like comment on the Unstructable and like get in touch and stuff, which is cool. 
Uh, I also write for a supply from hardware about manufacturing. And this was extra cool because if you say that you're a writer, you can go talk to people that you look up to and they'll talk to you. You can interview them. Um, you can go to a factory and be like, I'm a writer. Can I visit your factory? And they'll often say yes. Um, so that, that was really great. Um, so how did I actually get my first job? Um, I randomly met Kevin Liang at Noisebridge, and he runs EcoCube, which is a company that makes um, hydroponic and aquaponic desktop kits. So these are consumer electronics products. It's a little desktop garden that like waters itself. Um, I started doing acrylic prototyping for them out of Noisebridge. Um, and then Kevin invited me to start listening in on their engineering meetings. This was in about March 2018, so March last year. Um, and then in May that year, Kevin was like, do you want to go to China to see the factory? And I was like, yes. So I went on a trip to China with them. Um, Kevin kindly paid for it. And I guess I was useful there um, because they hired me to start working in August. Um, so these are the products that they had when I started. So there's the EcoCube Air on that side and then the EcoCube C, which is their flagship um, aquaponic uh, product in the middle and then the EcoCube Frame. So my job was coordinating with the factory to make improvements based on manufacturability, customer feedback. And these are two products that I actually had a hand in productionizing. So they were working on uh, making these and selling them, but they hadn't yet. So one is the EcoCube C, which is a bigger version of their, sorry, the EcoCube C Plus, which is a bigger version of the C. And then um, you have the Sprout, which is um, a microgreen garden on the side. And if you want to know more about EcoCube, um, I don't know if, how many of you were here last year at, at Super Conference? Yeah, so they, they actually gave out a paper of publication last year, and one of the stories that I wrote was actually about EcoCube and the manufacturing, uh, the manufacturing manager and mother of two that we had at the factory. So not only does she manage the manufacturing and the supply chain at the factory, she also cooks this for the factory, for the people at the factory every day, and she has two kids, so. Um, that was a pretty cool story. And then if you want to know a little bit more about EcoCube and why they use assembled acrylic, um, you can also read about the $100,000 mistake, which is also published on Supply Frame Hardware. Um, Kevin's $100,000 $100, mistake was basically making a lot of its expensive injection molds um, when he could have been doing acrylic. So that, that's a picture of the injection molds that I saw at the factory, which are not all his. Um, so. I actually haven't been qualified for either of the jobs I've taken since graduating from school. I have a biochemistry degree with some um, computer science courses, but not enough for a CS minor. Um, so even for my full-time job doing site reliability engineering, I had to do a lot of learning on the job. Um, and I think you can do this kind of career transition too. And I will explain how. So number one, document everything. Um, document what you're learning, both to help you remember, but also to tell people what you're doing um, so they can reach out to you if they can help. Um, and then care about your work. So the key to learning on the job, in my opinion, is simply to care. In manufacturing, caring about the product and the process is often enough for you to ask the correct questions to prompt improvements. Um, and then the last thing is technical mentorship. So I find that technical mentorship compared to just like bumbling around on Google trying to figure out myself is like 10 times more, um, 10 times faster in terms of learning and progress. So I'll tell you how to figure out who and how you can ask for help. So first, documenting your work. I mentioned personal branding. Um, th so this is like visibility for uh, people hoping to hire someone. Um, this is also a way for people to give you advice, collaborations, and then also sometimes people react to your documentation in unexpected ways. Um, and the Leave Me Alone sweater was an example of that. So I threw it up on Instructables, um, and then it, it randomly went viral. Like I had no expectation of this happening, because um, I, didn't, I didn't really like post about it on social media or anything. I just put it on Instructables. Um, and then a bunch of different publications on the internet were picking up, I think starting with Board Panda. Um, I ended up working with Beta Brand, which is kind of like a Kickstarter for clothes in San Francisco. Um, so they did a campaign with me and they sold 350 sweaters and they gave me a cut, which was $2,000. I ended up blowing the $2,000 on a failed Kickstarter campaign. Um, 
But in the process, I took a, took a course on manufacturing soft goods, quality control, tech packs, domestic versus overseas. I did a, a sewing production boot camp. Um, so I learned a lot in the process. Um, I really love documentation uh, so much that my friend Jennifer and I bought ilovedocumentation.com. Um, we also have stickers that look like this, and if you want one, you can ask me. Um, the second point is caring about your work. So by wanting to understand and optimize the process, you will ask the right questions to prompt specialists, the engineer at your factory, to make the right improvements um, for quality control, manufacturability, product usability, and I have a couple examples. So these are the pumps that go inside the EcoCube C. Um, we started getting increased complaints from customers about the pump being noisy, like having a buzzing sound. Um, and the factory already tests every single pump in a basin of water to make sure that it worked and wasn't too noisy um, because they'd, they'd had this problem in one of the initial production runs, and so they needed to test. Um, after a lot of testing, measuring decibel levels, um, we figured out that the pumps could be noisy depending on the size of the container that they were inside. And so the fix was to have the factory test each pump inside the aquarium instead of inside the bigger basin of water. And so that's an example of solving kind of a technical problem, but like without having necessarily a technical background. Um, here's another example. So this is the EcoCube C and C Plus side by side. Um, so the light is actually made from the same injection mold, but you can see that um, there's differences, right? So we needed to make the we needed to make the hole for the LEDs bigger because there's more LEDs. Um, and then we also needed to add some drill holes in the back to, for it to attach to the EcoCube C+. And the factory told me that they would modify the mold. And I was like, that is so cool. I was so excited. I wanted to write an article for Supply from Hardware about mold modification. So I was like, oh, can you call the injection molding factory and ask them how they modify the mold to be able to do this? And of course, they called the factory, and the injection molding factory said, you can't actually modify the mold this way. They were going to CNC it, and it would cost more money. Um, so getting technical mentorship. Um, I think as a junior engineer, you can get by just by caring about your work. But if you want long-term career progression, you probably want to gain more technical skills. Um, and so the way that I've been able to do this is um, reaching out to people through social media, meeting them in communities that are related to hardware and manufacturing, um, whether it's like a makerspace, conferences like this one, or a hardware meetup, um, and also like a formal tutoring arrangement with a friend. Um, so this, I, uh, before I started my part-time job, I didn't know how to do CAD, and so I had to figure it out, um, and it took me a long time, um, and I, uh, this is a drawing that I made. I met somebody named Adrian Kelly at Noisebridge, and um, kindly, he was he was willing to run a lesson about CAD if I organized it. So I would organize like a meetup for people to come and learn about Fusion 360, and he would show up and teach it. And so through that and through other friends, I learned about like doing parameters properly in CAD instead of like typing in each measurement separately and having to like fix everything if I changed one thing. Um, and so I, this was the most complicated drawing I made. It was a, this is a wall anchor for mounting the EcoCube, the microgreen products onto the wall. And we needed a drawing so that we could have uh, a line drawing for the instructions. Um, you may remember, remember this product from my talk at last year's Supercon. Um, this is a hydroponic grow box that was being worked on. Um, so I actually got formal tutoring for this um, from my friend Chow Doan, who I met at Teardown, which is a conference in Portland hosted by Crowd Supply. Um, so for $500 of tutoring, so Chow gives me a very good deal. He's, I'm like his guinea pig for um, teaching, so normally his, his consultant rate is like twice what he's actually charging me. Um, so he taught me a bunch of firmware fundamentals, including internal and external interrupts, which I talked about at my last talk. And so that was about $500 of uh, lessons, like about one a month, and me working on homework in between. Um, we paid him $500 for a code review of the code for this product, um, which was written by a PCB engineer, and so it had a lot of issues. It was super brittle. Um, and I was able to actually fix the biggest issues um, that Chow mentioned in the code review. Um, so that we could put something that was in production that was better. Um, and so I was doing this on the side um, to learn. Um, another engineer was actually the one like owning this product, but the company actually covered my tutoring. So that ended up very well. 
Um, so this is the TLDR of the talk. With hard work over time, you can circumvent the traditional career path and transition effectively into your dream job. It's not easy, but I think you can do it. Um, and you don't have to quit your day job. I actually really prefer the stability of my day job. I like not stressing out about money. Um, this is me in 2019, so I actually had a baby in April. Um, I think he's somewhere in the back um, with my husband. Oh, they're over there. <laughs> in the back over there. Um, so I uh, ended my engagement with EcoCube before my maternity leave for my day job ended uh, because it was, it was just too many hours per week when you have so many products, you, you have to have regular meetings with the factory and it, I just didn't have the flexibility to like also have a baby and day job, so that had to go. Um, so currently I'm working on single product development and productionization, so usually it's a friend has a cool idea and they want to manufacture it and I'll work with them on that. Um, and my goal right now is to be a contract manufacturer with the idea that um, I could do manufacturing and also make more money than if I was just being paid for my hours. So I act as like the supplier kind of and then take a cut. So this is a product that I'm currently working on um, with my friend Melissa. It's uh, therealpocket.com. It's a pocket extender for women's jeans, <laughs> um, which often have pockets that aren't big enough to fit your phone, which is ridiculous. Uh, phones are so slim, slim now that it shouldn't be a problem to have a big enough pocket. Um, so the, the way that this arrangement works with her is that um, she's currently paying me a monthly kind of a retention fee as I do like the prototyping and product development until we reach, reach a certain number of units of production per order um, and then I'll just be the supplier or the contract manufacturer. And I'm sure this is the burning question that everybody has. Um, how do you find the spare time to do this? Um, and I've, I've had some learnings uh, in the past couple years doing these things uh, alongside my day job. So number one, your productivity will never increase. If you are already trying to be a productive person, you're probably already doing like as many things as you could possibly fit. Um, so how could you do more? By not doing other things. You can do the things that you want to do more by strategically dropping the ball on stuff. And you can get pretty deep on this. Um, for example, you have to wash your dirty laundry but do you have to put away your clean laundry? <laughs> um, yeah, we used to have a clean laundry pile, but then we put it in a box, and so now we have a clean laundry box. Um, and that's been working fine for us. We survive. Um, do you have to be on time for things? It depends. Some things you have to be on time for. Um, I had a Mandarin class where I was, it was a two-hour class, and I was consistently an hour late, because I was always trying to get things done before the class. And, um, they got used to it, and it was fine. And I got to practice Mandarin every week, so it was okay. Um, if you're at a party for 10 minutes and you're not really feeling it, do you have to stay? No, no you don't, you can leave. Um, and then the other thing that I learned is to really get to know yourself and how you're feeling and what your current capacity is um, with the fluctuations of like emotions and mood and tiredness and stuff. So sometimes you're in the zone and you can get you can get intense thinky things done, like you can do some coding. Um, sometimes you're, you're just like fried and you can't get anything done, so you might as well just take a break, relax, sleep, whatever. Um, or sometimes you need to get an unrelated thing done so that you can get back your motivation to do the thing that you wanted to do. So I love to do baking. I love eating desserts and I love to do baking so I can eat more desserts. Um, sometimes you're in a halfway state where you can, you're like tired but you can do something that's a little bit productive but like calming, so I like to read a book when I feel this way. Um, and, the, and overall, the more I know myself, the more I see that if I get a good night's sleep, like that determines how productive I am the next day. Like that's the biggest factor by far. So with a baby, just some days are more productive than others. And this is, this is them. This, this is Baby Lee and Robin. Special thanks to them. Um, they're super supportive. Uh, you can't choose how supportive your baby is, but we got very lucky. <laughs> um, and just the last point, um, Aviva Wittenberg-Cox from the Harvard Business Review tells it like it is. Um, there was a study that was done, and they said that the, while the women almost unanimously described their husbands as supportive, they also told how those husbands refused to alter their own work schedule or increase their participation in caregiving. Um, more than half the men expected their careers to take precedence over their wives' careers, while most women expected egalitarian marriages. Um, sometimes I tell Robin, like, 
thank you so much. Like he, so he definitely takes more than 50% of the childcare when we're not at work, like when I'm busy. And so I'm like, thank you so much. Like I really appreciate it, you're so supportive. And he looks at me and he's like, Ruth, the bar is very low. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Um, that's me. That's it. Uh, I think we have some time for questions. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs>